You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means it is time to commence our broadcast week here on the Options Insider Radio Network. It is time for episode uno of your bi-weekly extravaganza known as the Option Block. And yes, I will be your host, your guide here. My name, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-scintillating network upon which you are binging not just the Option Block, but, of course, Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio. Oh, I'm blanking on my all my own shows now. Twifo, This Week in Futures Option, The Advisor's Option, Volatility Views, as well as, of course, all you cool kids in the secret club getting even more fun. I neglected to mention the Crypto Rundown coming up a little bit later today with a great guest. And then on top of that, if you guys want more in your ear holes, of course, you have Pro Q&As getting a double dose of Pro Q&As this week. So look forward to that. That should be fun. Got the return of the Viceroy tomorrow. Haven't talked to him in forever, but we were talking about cheap options, and it seemed like that sent up the bat signal to the Viceroy, and he wanted to return to answer your questions once again, as well as uh, Mr. Greg. I do believe Mr. Greg Magadini from Genesis will be answering your questions tomorrow as well. So a double dose of crypto in your lives in the next couple of days. Of course, options oddities after Friday's bell and a whole bunch more. You know where to go to learn all about that. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to begin your journey. And before we begin our journey today, before I welcome on my cohorts, my compatriots, who are, of course, the unclest of Mike's, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussauds from St. Charles Wealth Management, and indeed, the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Before I welcome those two on, we must commence our broadcast week in high fashion. And you know we like to guess an 80s wrestler or two. This week really seems more appropriate to do that gimmick than ever because we're coming hot off the heels of WrestleMania weekend. And, you know, listeners, even the old school kind of jaded 80s wrestling fan in me, that I like some of the new stuff. My son has dragged me begrudgingly into the modern era of wrestling, but I'll always be an 80s kid at heart for all that stuff. There was, I will say, a fair dose of nostalgia for even us jaded old school wrestling fans this weekend, enough to bring a smile even to my cold, dead heart. One of it was The Undertaker. They trotted him out for the uh, Hall of Fame stuff, and that was kind of fun to see the whole Undertaker entrance. It's a spectacle. And the other one was this, today's featured performer, if you will, making his return to action for the first time in 19 years this past weekend. Not once, but a surprise twist. He did it twice. (laughs) And this person, I think it's fair to say, Far and away, the most popular wrestler of the 90s, the Attitude Era. Now, we usually like to guess the 80s. I did look it up. This person began his career in 1989. So technically, he counts as an 80s wrestler, even though 
the name, the persona that everyone came to know as synonymous with 90s Attitude Era wrestling began, obviously, in the 90s. How big was this guy? Well, let's just say he won the WWF Championship six times. The IC belt, my personal favorite, the old school warrior and all those old school hardcore guys, they had the IC belt. He won that twice. A million dollar championship. He somehow got Ted DiBiase's belt. He won that. Tag team belt four times. He was a five time triple crown champion. He won the Royal Rumble three times. They, he was so over. They just kept throwing everything at him. He also won King of the Ring and he headlined WrestleMania four times. So this person, fair to say, a big deal. Making his return this weekend, can you guess this 90s Attitude Era wrestler? There you go. That should give you a hint. Once you hear that glass breaking, I think you kind of know who's coming down the aisle there. Let's now open up the buzzers. When I say three, two, one, go, they will both buzz in. I would be stunned <laughs> if both of them don't know this one, but we'll see. Three, two, one, go. Buzz. Oh, hey. I heard the meatball first. Mr. Meatball, I kind of expected you to buzz in for this one. He is indeed now another one of your neighbors. Known far and wide also as the Texas Rattlesnake, Mr. Meatball, of whom am I speaking? Uh, I believe it's Stunning Steve Austin. <laughs> yes, that's who came back this now, weekend. A very fancy guy and a fancy here and everything. Yeah, Stunning Steve Austin came back, yes. Yes, no, Stone Cold Steve Austin, everyone's favorite. Uh, r- the Texas Rattler, the, uh, the, the Anger Austin 3, 316, everyone loves it. Well, your, your fellow Texanites were, I think... To put it mildly, losing their minds for this guy this weekend in Dallas when he showed up and it did the whole ATV thing. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not even an Attitude Era guy. I kind of missed most of that. So there's not a lot of nostalgia beats to this for me. And even I had fun kind of watching him come in and do all of his stuff again. And then they did it again the next night. It was so popular. It's a two-night event now. And he came in and did the thing with Mr. McMahon, like 89-year-old Vince McMahon taking stunners in the ring again. It was insane. So, yes, uh, madness afoot. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, A, did you know that? I'm sure you did. And B, what are your enduring memories of the Texas Rattlesnake, a.k.a. Stunning Steve Austin, a.k.a. The Ringmaster, a.k.a. Stone Cold, sir? You know, Stone Cold, he really, he was exactly what wrestling needed in that era to kind of give it a boost in that um, wrestling didn't really have a direction at that time. And he really saved the business, I think, and ultimately made it go to the stratosphere with what he did in the late 90s. Uh, I I don't think there's anyone out there who doesn't have a ton of respect for Steve Austin. Um, he was, when WCW was beating WWF in the Monday Night War ratings, once Stone Cold, they let him run run loose. He really changed the wor- wrestling, the wrestling world in a major way. And, uh, He's the type of guy that uh, he represented all the people that wanted to quit their jobs and uh, tell off their boss. He did it. And there was just a ton of popularity with him. Some of our chat was guessing edge. Oh, Frank, good to see Frank in there. He actually got stone cold, right? So well done there, Frank. (laughs) Uh, But you're right. People don't know. After the heyday of what we watched, the Andre, the Hogan, the macho, the warrior era of the 80s, wrestling kind of fell off. And by the mid 90s, It was, I think, to put it mildly, really, in dire straits. It wasn't anywhere near as popular as it used to be. And then this whole Stone Cold Mr. McMahon gimmick took off, and it just became the, really, in many ways, you're right, maybe did save 
the business. So there's a lot of fondness for this character <laughs> as, uh, as uh, over the top as it may be right now. It's still kind of fun. And no, what else is fun? It's the trading block. So let's get to it. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. Yeah, some of our chat who are lapsed, uh, lapsed wrestling fans didn't watch WrestleMania. They didn't know. They didn't know Stone Cold came back. Yes, he did come back, and he he stunned Vince McMahon. So that was just all sorts of uh, of crazy. Even the diehard black hearts of us cynical old school wrestling fans, I think, had a little bit of joy this weekend. Taker, Stone Cold, a bunch of other fun stuff. It kind of reminded you why pro wrestling can be fun when they do it right. All right, let's keep on rolling. Let's see if the markets are fun today. And, you know, they kind of were a little bit mixed. Then we were kind of like, okay, here we go, rah, rah, back to the green. And then it seems like maybe we're trending back a little bit to the mix. But it kind of depends where you're looking right now. Uh, The Dow, when we kicked off the show, kind of almost exactly unched, actually. And the S&P up almost half a percent, a little over 0.4%. And the NASDAQ feeling its oats 1.5% to the upside out there. So, again, it's one of those days where it kind of depends where you're looking, where you're hanging your hat, what kind of day you're having out there. And if you're hanging out in a name like, like Twitter, for example, apparently everyone's really excited that Elon Musk owns 9% of Twitter. Now, that thing off of 30%. <laughs> oh, good times we all live in, listeners. Stone Cold's back. Musk driving not just Tesla and Bitcoin and all the other names, now driving Twitter as well, because why not? And let's see what's going on. When we kicked off the show, we had VIX kind of doing a heck of a lot of, not really a ton, to put it mildly. It was down about a point from where it was on last show. It was right around 19 and a quarter when we kicked off the show. VIX, when we started this dance, 108, down two points from last show. VXX, 24 and a quarter, down one and a quarter points. From last show, UVXY uh, back down to the 12 handle, down about half a point after getting some juice back over the latter part of last week. Remember, we were talking about not too long ago. Oh, my goodness. It's threatening the 10 handle. What's going to happen out there? Then it kind of reversed a bit. Now getting starting to get some of that downside juice back. And Vol Q, a.k.a. the Vol of NASDAQ down one and three quarters from last show at about a 22 even when we kicked off the show. Let's go around the horn. Oh, and I neglected, neglected to mention. <laughs> talking about Stone Cold coming back. Guy hasn't wrestled in 19 years. Took a suplex on the concrete. <laughs> so I don't know if that's going to do long-term good for all of the legion, the myriad injuries he's had that he had to retire from 20 years ago. But nonetheless, he, he brought it in the, what, what form he could over the weekend. <laughs> all right, let's go around the horn. First, let's go to Mr. Meatball because he won. A, if you have any other enduring thoughts on the, the Texas rattlesnake your neighbor now have at it. B, would you ever take a suplex on the concrete and see uh, if you have time, sir, what's catching your eye on the market today? Uh, I love the attitude area. That was really fun. Um, that was, you know, that was my heyday in college. We'd sit around on Monday and flip between the Monday night wars and stuff like that. NWO was really kind of cool for a little bit. And then it just stopped being cool so fast and they stopped being over and it just got, you know, they had all these different NWOs. They couldn't. Well, it hurts couldn't when there's like 40 guys in the same in the group, right? <laughs> yeah, Hogan's ego blew up. Hogan's ego blew up, and it was just real bad that everything had to run through them, and and it was just stupid. Yeah, the Wolf Pack, the NWO Red. It was just so dumb. Like, how many different NWOs could you have? <laughs> Meanwhile, you've got the the corporate champion, The Rock. That heel turn was just beautiful uh, for The Rock. And, you know, you had The Undertaker in there, and it was like them versus Stone Cold. It was it was great. You should definitely watch some of the highlights from WrestleMania this week. I think it'll touch you in the feel spots, sir, certain parts uh, of Taker, it, it was, Stone Cold. It was pretty cool. It was just so great. I, I love that stuff. And, you know, big fan of The Rock. When he went heel, that was just absolutely unbelievable. And they couldn't even keep him heel because everyone was still cheering for him when he was a heel. Uh, that is just that good. Uh, so yeah, I love, I love that era. That was the best. So, uh, I'm going to have to check out, uh, WrestleMania. Would you say really quickly, would you say you're more of an attitude era or an eighties wrestling fan? You know, I caught both of them. I was really into the Hulk Hogan era. And then, um, you know, I got, I would say I got more into the attitude area for a shorter period of time, but was more interested in wrestling in the eighties, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, there was nothing like being a, 
junior in college on a on a Monday and sitting there watching uh, wrestling with a couple of beers. And, <laughs> it had a cool and, had a period there where wrestling was cool, not just for kids. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, it was actually absolutely unbelievable. Uh, that was just really fun. And like we went, I remember one time we went to Hooters and we did a, because uh, uh, the the guy that ran Hooters was a a fraternity brother, so he would hook us up with free food, and we uh, we did a pool for the Royal Rumble, and everyone paid to, to draw na- draw numbers out of a hat and stuff like that. It was. It was awesome. Right, I'm down next year. We're doing a pool for the Royal Rumble. That just sounds fun. Whether we do it in Hooters or not, I don't know. But uh, definitely a pool for it, the Royal The wings Rumble. are good. I will say that. That's, that is a good place to watch Attitude Era Wrestling Hooters. Kind of appropriate, I think. Absolutely. 100%. All right. And if you have time, sir, anything catching your eye on the markets today? Uh, we're up. Uh, we're threatening around 45, 70 again. Uh, market looks like it maybe wants to make another push. Uh, vol down 0.4 in the VIX, but when you adjust for the weekend, that's actually a pretty strong move lower in vol. That's why you're seeing a lot of the ETPs, uh, your your UVXY, your v- even your VXX, your VIX-C. Uh, UVIX down 7%, the new the new one. Uh, SVIX up, uh, just lots of uh, lots of stuff. And then yeah, Twitter off to the races up. 12 bucks, unbelievably. Uh, you got some strength in the biotechs today, some strength off a of Barron's article. Uh, consumer cyclicals have been crushing it. Uh, they're up again. Uh, and despite the fact that oil is up pretty big, you've got energy, uh, energy soft today. They've been kind of um, breaking correlation between oil and XLE, where you know we've seen XLE having nice days on days where oil really isn't doing much or is down and actually getting a little selling on these big updates. Yeah, you're right. We do have to start incorporating uh, the newest additions to the vol space, in particular SVIX, into our rundowns. Now we have new vol products to discuss, kind of just going live last week. We kind of touched on them a little bit on vol views. I think we'll get to them more maybe this week and in subsequent weeks once we have some actual trading data behind us. The options had pretty much just listed. They were minty fresh when we kicked off the show on, on Friday. So kind of hard to draw a lasting conclusion, but we are asking you to draw some conclusions right now, listeners. Our question of the week just went live right before showtime. As I mentioned last week, these products kind of contentious. You know, ever since XIV blew up a lot of people in the vol space, there have been a lot of people who have come out and said, you know, maybe these inverse vol products are probably best left in the ash pin of history there. Maybe you don't need to revisit this. Other people out there like the SIBO and exchanges who never really saw VIX futures recover from the death of XIV and people in the trading world, they want these back. They think, and also a lot of retail, they think it clearly serves a need despite the risks. So it's kind of a contentious product. In fact, we did a quick flash poll right during vol views last week, really quick one. And I kind of predicted it would be contentious and it turned out to be pretty much exactly 50-50. You guys voting whether or not Will you trade them? And the answer was 50-50, yes or no. So we thought we'd build on that a little bit this week. If you get on over there to add options now, just went live, listeners. If you're listening on the podcast, you'll have a chance to vote as well. This is our question of the week. It's live all week. If you don't see it there pinned for whatever reason, just scroll down our Twitter a little bit. I know we put out a lot of tweets. I get it. But it should be there. You can find it. We tend to retweet it so you folks can get access to it and find it later in the week as well. We're asking this week, many people thought inverse vol products died alongside XIV in 2018. But the launch of SVIX last week has rekindled that debate over whether these products should even exist. So we put the question to you. Should inverse volatility products exist? Very straightforward this week, listeners. Yes, they serve a purpose. Or no, they are too dangerous. Just went live. We'll get to some maybe results a little bit later in the show. Now we go to the uncleist of Mike's. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, uh, did you happen, happen to catch any of the glory that was the wrestling over the weekend. And then B, if you have time, sir, what's catching your eye on a kind of Uncle Mike kind of day, especially if you own Twitter? Very true. Uh, so, I mean, I, I got to see the highlights of Stone Cold coming into the ring on his four-wheeler. That was pretty darn cool. Uh, it still didn't quite live up to the time that he drove a beer truck into the ring and uh, squirted a beer hose on Mr. McMahon and, uh, or on The Rock, I believe it was. But uh, that's probably my most enduring memory of Stone Cold. Uh, and I have a lot of fond memories of the Attitude Era. Seabass and I are, I think we're the same age, maybe one year older or younger. But I remember in college, uh, my enduring memory of the Attitude Era in college is I can remember 
walking into the locker room before football practice at times, talking about how great Hollywood Hogan was with the NWO, and then telling people Hollywood Hogan is who made wrestling. If it wasn't for Hollywood Hogan, we'd, we wouldn't have a business these days. And so I would get people livid. I mean, and I'm not kidding, like almost ready to fight me saying it's not Hollywood Hogan, it's Hulk Hogan that did it. And, and just of how that was and just how intense the whole thing was with the NWO and the WCW, the uh, Monday Night Wars with the WWF at the time. Uh, so definitely a lot of fond memories from the Attitude Era. I mean, I'm definitely, if I had to pick, I, I got to go with the 80s era because that's what made it what it was. But uh, I definitely have a lot of very fond memories of um, of the Attitude Era as well. I, I think, and uh, I, like we called our equipment manager Vicious because his name was Sid. Um, and I can just, I can remember just in the locker room before practice having many very, we talked about strategies of wrestlers with the same level of intellect that we talk about options on the option block. That's how, <laughs> how serious it was at that time. So many fond memories. Oh, and did I mention I went to college kind of down South? So maybe that was why. <laughs> but, uh, that probably helps. Yes. Nonetheless, nonetheless uh, in the markets today, I think that uh, it's, it's kind of like, Right now, we have a 20-point move in the S&P, and it feels like we're not really moving that much just because of all the vol volatility that we've had the last month or so. Uh, we don't. It's like the market's like, what's going on? This is just such a boring day. We have no global pandemics. We have no threats of World War III. We have no capital insurrections. We, there's none of that. What the heck's going on? Why bother getting up in the morning? That's kind of what it feels like today. Uh, so we do have a half a percent move in the SPX uh, with the 20 points or so that it, that's moved. And uh, right now, I think that to the upside, um, 4,600, we broke it for a little while last week, but we went right back below it. So that, I think, is my uh, next ceiling of the market, if you will. So we'll see where we can, we can get through that. Uh, I believe that right now with earnings season coming up, uh, that's going to be the next thing that moves the market unless something else does. Now, I know that's very profound, but the reason I say that is just because of all the global macro risk potential that's happening in the world right now. But uh, anything could happen, of course, as always. Uh, but right now, it's uh, there's a lot of potential for something to happen. I Not that I want to know, but I'd be curious if we have some news that comes out for a new variant of COVID, would the market even care? That might even be a poll to put on on the option block on on the on your Twitter, Mark. Would the market even care if we'd have a new variant at this point, just because of everything that's that's been happening in this world? So I think that's going on. Uh, then the final thing, we're getting a little bit of buying in the ten-year note, so it looks like we are somewhat at a, a floor with where we are uh, for now, uh, based on where the market was last week in the ten-year. So we'll see where things are going. And that's the bottom line, because Uncle Mike said so. I like it. Now go drink uh, all your beers and go stun someone as we keep on <laughs> as we keep on rolling here. Let's go on out to Vic's land. You know, Vix, on a day where it seems like it's kind of not doing a heck of a lot, all things considered, and the market isn't, outside of NASDAQ and a couple of names, really isn't doing a heck of a lot. Uh, we're seeing some paper in Vix today, closing in on 400,000 contracts right now, 398,000 contracts. That's a heck of a lot. I thought it'd be. I thought we'd be at a buck fifty, a buck eighty, maybe two hundred if things were active. This is usually not the kind of day that drives a lot of VIX paper. And the ADV right now five fifty nine. That's come off a little bit again. I had to go look and see what it is. Looks like around uh, seventy nine, almost eighty thousand of those contracts coming. Looks like a bit of a June Nov roll going up forty three thousand five hundred seventy roll. By the way, forty three thousand five hundred times on the June by thirty six thousand on the note, doing it for 25 cents, looks like. We have seen that spread go off a few times before. So it seems like someone's lurking out there whenever they whenever they like that level in the term structure, they do, I think they've done it for less. I think 15 cents I saw it for before. So 25 may be a little bit widening of that spread. But either way, nearly, nearly 80,000 contracts going up in that one print. That's only, it looks like a taste of what we're seeing out there. Because again, almost 400,000 contracts out there today. So intriguing stuff i'm looking for some of those outlandish calls july 75 is going up about ten thousand times i just mentioned the june nov 70s so people are playing in those shall we say uh exotic strikes out there nearly four hundred thousand contracts up in the vix right now spy 
looking more along the lines of what I expected around two and three quarters million shy of even half of its ADV, which is about six and a quarter right now. The S 850,000 contracts. So about what you expect in the S right now, the ADV about almost 1.7 million Uh, IWM kind of shrugging its shoulders, 273,000 contracts on the tape out there. The ADV 697. So back below 700 K let's get out to the single name. Most actives. I bet you can probably guess what's number one today. I'll let you stew on that a little bit as we get to number 10. It's our old friend Palantir. We've been talking about this one a few times on options oddities lately. I know the Rock Lobster was loving himself some 10 puts out there. We were talking about all sorts of various put strikes out there and even one by twos on the show last week. Uh, this one catching a bit out there is if you sold some puts out there, maybe you're, you got a smile on your face today. Up 5%. I haven't had a chance to see what the news is out there in Palantir today. But either way, uh, folks liking themselves some Palantir, 14 and a half bucks right now, up about 70 odd cents on the day. Good for number 10, 210,000. So that's, again, about, it's not a, not a nothing day. It's not a blow your doors off day either. It's kind of about an average top 10, 210,000 contracts. Number nine, our old friend Baba, still hanging out in the top 10 today. It comes in at number nine, 218,000. Number eight was so much, musk related news in the headlines today you know another eb name has to be popping in this case it's neo three hundred thirty-five thousand contracts number seven it's nvidia yes all the way down to number seven today uh three hundred thirty-six thousand contracts that's interesting number six i guess you can call him the once again king of the apes <laughs> amc amc let's see what they're up to today amc after they're now in their gold mining venture oh off about one percent so not a huge huge action pack they you know things like they'd have a bit of a swing they were up to about 23 and a half this morning where they opened sold off to right around almost 22 bucks then rallied back up to 23 and a half so they have had a bit of a range out there today listeners good for 365,000 contracts on the number six spot on our countdown number five facebook 382,000 contracts number four it's amd 497,000 contracts number three yes i said number three it's tesla 867. Nobody cares about Tesla today because they're all about another Musk name. <laughs> number two. Yes, I said number two. It's Apple. 880,000 contracts. And number one with a freaking bullet. I can't remember the last time we saw this name even in the top 10, let alone number one listeners. It's Twitter. Yes, you probably guessed it. Up 11 and a half bucks right now. We're nearly 30% hot off the heels of that uh, the news broke this morning that Musk now owns 9%, I believe. Of Twitter, either way, that's good for nearly 1.2 million contracts out there in Twitter land today. Speaking of contracts, let's get to this really quick before we get on out to the madness that is the odd block right now. Uh, The numbers are finally in from OCC for March. Hot off the presses here. And, you know, we were talking about this on the advisors option. We were talking about this on this show and every other show since the pandemic began. Is like, you know, what is going on from an options volume perspective? So far, the answer has been a whole heck of a lot of it. And the other question that obviously follows on that is, can this continue? And year after year now, the answer has been yes. And we kicked off this year again. I was starting to say, hey, maybe my cynicism has been beaten out of me. And then the Jan numbers kind of reinforced that, blown the doors off. February kind of fell off a little bit. And so maybe that was some people thinking maybe the dam starting to break. We've been talking about this on the advisor's option last week. It seems like the ADV numbers from March weren't looking super strong, either decent, but nothing blowing the doors off. But now the final numbers, it's like we had a bit of a rally here in the end of the month from a volume perspective, because March now coming in the number two most active options month in history. And that's up for almost four and a half percent from this time last year, which was again, a banger of a month because we were hot on in mean land this time last year. So March volume was 943.7 million contracts that's a lot (laughs) we couldn't even break the 900 million level not too long ago so it seems like maybe those days of even threatening a billion contracts a month were maybe behind us but not this month again that's up 4.4 percent compared to march of last year uh the year to date average also ticking back up now we were kind of talking on the advisors option maybe it was looking a little bit lower now it's up to 42.7 million contracts so uh Good stuff here. Let's look. Oh, also, by the way, the highest volume quarter. <laughs> highest volume, I should say, highest volume Q1. Highest volume Q1 in the history of the business as well. It makes sense when January is the number one month. March is the number two. February can almost do nothing. It doesn't really matter. You're going to have a hot, active month. Right, here, let's look really quickly and drill down. Let's see. Equity options of that total, 536.8 million. 
was equity options. Actually, that one's down 8.7% from this time last year. Again, maybe some of that volume moving away from the insanity that was single names a year ago and back into indexes and ETFs, which we'll see in a second. Let's drill into ETFs right now. 348.8 million. That's up 29.7% from this time last year. So yeah, clearly a lot of that single name paper now flowing into ETFs and other also indexes, index volume. 53 and a half million contracts. That's up 28% from this time last year. If you're wondering the futures, fixed futures still kind of struggling to find their footing. Four and a half, almost 4.6 million contracts. That's down nearly 15%. Another reason why I think SIBO was pretty active to get that new <laughs> inverse vol product listed again, hoping to rekindle the futures, pun intended, of the VIX futures out here. So at least for right now, the answer is yes. Back at the party is still on out there in options land. Looks like we have hot new reports coming hot off the heels right now from our friends over there at ORATS listeners. Again, hot off the press is just landing in my hands. Here's look really quickly. Again, we're kind of between seasons right now. Uh, we got a new updated earnings move report for this week. Levi's on there, the sixth after the bell. 1983 is where they were trading as of a few minutes ago. Uh, the Straddle about a buck fifty in the past. It was a buck even. So they're adding fifty percent more juice out here in Levi's Jean Juice. Who knew? April seventh before the bell. Constellation Brands two thirty three and three quarters. They're pricing in in an even nine bucks. That's interesting. In the past they've moved eight thirty. So a little bit of extra juice out there. We got a whole bunch of other ones you can check out for yourselves, their listeners. As we're looking at uh, the beginnings. Dare I say at the beginnings of the new cycle, but we'll wait to sink our teeth into it a little bit. All right now, hanging at 73 long straddles, 60 short straddles, and 102 long calendars that we're monitoring right now for you folks, completely for free because we like you, theoptionsinsider.com. Now we got to keep on rolling, listeners. It is time to unleash the eye of Sauron. It is time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. Let's do it. Let us unleash the beast, see where it fixes its fiery gaze today. Going to kick things off. You know, if there was a type of paper, which, dare I say it, maybe the odd block was designed for, <laughs> it was crazy call paper in some cheapy little biotech. That's almost kind of the name of the game when we first started doing this. We talked about a lot of this kind of stuff. We know you folks love it. So once again, our eye of Sauron, inexorably drawn to the lower cost biotechs. Today, it is Teva Pharmaceutical Industries, ticker symbol Teva, T-E-V-A. I haven't talked about this one in a while. I used to be a frequent offender back in the day. Trading today, a little bit shy of 10 bucks, 988, up about half a buck or 5%. So nice little pop for them today. Not a great year, but not an apocalyptic year and certainly looking a lot better just in the last few weeks. <laughs> a year ago, they were trading 11 and a half bucks. Obviously, they're down on the year. And they sold off, looks like they rallied on June 10th, not June 8th, listeners, to 11 and 11.72. That was their high for the year. Then sold off pretty much a month later to 8.38 in July. And they kind of bounced in that kind of 8 to almost 10 buck range a few times over the course of the year until this, this new year started. And then they got caught up in the sell-off like everything else. Bottomed out on March 14th at $7.34 before uh, turning around aggressively to where they are right now, 9.89, up another 50 cents today. So Teva getting the lift. This is, of course, an Israeli pharma name, listeners, if that intrigues you out there. And it looks like, Mr. Meatball, somebody's out here saying, you know what? This party is on in Teva. It's happening right now, and I want to be part of it. I want my ticket here. I'm going to go pay 12 cents for 9,844 of the April 10 calls, so pretty much at the money calls right now. They did this actually almost... 50 cents ago, the stock was nine and a half bucks when they started buying these. Then they came in and bought about a thousand more for 16 cents. And they kept doing that, chipping away at them pretty much all day until when we kicked off the show, they had done 25,000 of these April 10 calls for a variety of prices from 12 cents. I think maybe they got as high as 18 cents. 
Uh, so a lot of paper here. This is roughly a 50 vol, about a 46 to 50 vol, depending on the prices they got here, listeners. So pretty juicy here. And again, not going out to June or December or anything like that. They're going out to April expiration and saying, hey, give me that 10 call love. And this, they're only a dime away right now. So <laughs> they're already looking pretty good. So the, the first test, is it bid in your favor? The answer for that one is yes. But Mr. Meatball, in all your big money flowing, did this Teva call palooza come on your radar? And what are your thoughts on these? Compared to a lot of the calls we profile here, these seem to be somewhat reasonable. What are your thoughts on these? They're not yeah, I mean, $5 away and happening tomorrow. Yeah, no, these are pretty overtly bullish. They're already right. You know, if they paid 15 cents, they're trading a quarter right now. Uh, and we've just seen a ton of volume there. There is a little bit of volume in the options for Thursday, about uh, 4,000 of those have traded. Those are trading 15 cents. You could talk me into the eight, the eight, uh, the 10 call spread between uh, this Thursday and next Friday for a dime. That's not a bad price. Um for a calendar spread, uh, but yeah, the pretty aggressively bullish uh, price action, looking for a move in the next nine trade, eight and a half trading days. So uh, maybe some news coming our way in in Teva. I know they've had lawsuits, so maybe maybe some sort of resolution there. I, I don't know. Was this but one on your big money flow radar, sir? This has definitely hit our radar. Are you and still are you still calling it the Gamdar? What the cool kids call it the Gamdar? No, no. No, we are not, and we never did. <laughs> Maybe it was just around these parts that we called it the gamut. May, I believe that that may be correct. But hey, you know, free branding advice. Use it if you will. We we shall encourage you. Gamdar. Who doesn't want to talk about Gamma Radar, listeners? It's the Gamdar. It's cool stuff. But yeah, I should mention, listeners, there are earnings in this name, but not in the cycle for the options, which is interesting. So all this call up, but the earnings are not to April 27th. So they don't even get any earnings bump in this. It's just straight up old school, old fashioned Israeli biotech biopharmaceutical call love here. What are your thoughts on these? You like these listeners? They're kind of bid in their favor right now. Uh, so intriguing stuff. Uh, for all the kind of swinging at the fences call trades we see these days, these ones are certainly cheaper, a little less cheap now, but uh, still cheaper, nearer dated, and not as insane as we've seen. People are, for a while, they were buying just about anything, that, any call strike they could in some of these names. So these a little bit more down to earth. I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are out there as we keep on rolling this looks like this is a a newcomer to the odd block which is always fun to see from buying calls we're flipping the script and we're blasting away looks like at some line in the sand puts this time in lamb weston holdings ticker symbol lw this is a american food processing company one of the world's largest producers and processors of frozen french fries so there you go this is going to be a French fry ball <laughs> trading right now. 16, excuse me, $60.76 off about three quarters of a percent. We're right around half a buck today on the year. It looks like frozen, uh, frozen fries, not looking good. You can probably imagine some production cost of goods, all sorts of things, inflation, logistics, a lot of things eating away at probably at their margins over the course of this past year, which is probably why the stock's down nearly 25% on the year. A year ago, it was trading $80.60, and it took uh, successive shocks to the system in July. It went from 76 bucks to 66 and then it did kind of that sold off continuously down to about 50 bucks in December, and then it bounced a bit to about, looks like, Actually, 70 bucks, 70 and a quarter on January 7th, then sold off again and all the madness down March 14th, hit its low for the year of 49.71. So it has rallied nice little pop from 49.71 to 60.72 over the last couple of weeks where it is right now. So catching a bit of a lift in the frozen fries. And it seems like someone out here is maybe buying this recent rally or at least saying, you know what? It's not going to give much of it back before April expiration because it coming in this morning. And they were blasting away on 2100 of the April double, a.k.a. the 55 puts listeners, doing that for 58 cents. Again, 2100 times. That's a 62 vol. The stock was a little bit lower, 60 and a half when these went up. Now, this one has earnings in the cycle. The earnings are coming up later this week on the 7th. So this one could be a little bit more dicey here. But he is getting a decent amount of juice here. But still, the stock was trading substantially lower not too long ago. So there is a fair chance this guy could get himself some 
Lamb Weston at uh, 55 bucks and the south of that here. By the way, in case you're wondering, 2100 doesn't sound like a ton, but this name it is. The ADB is 264 contracts, so not a lot of paper going up here at all in Lamb Weston. Mr. Meatball, I know you're a huge fan of this name, also a huge fan of a frozen French fry. What are your thoughts on someone drawing the line here at $55 in LW this far and no further, sir? Yeah, interesting play. Um, food has definitely been uh, one of the the names in play. This thing has had a really nasty rally. Uh, took it on the chin in late in early March and has recovered most of that move. Uh, we've seen it go lower before, but yeah, these are some some puts that are are they're basically saying, hey, yeah, we're gonna we want this primo and. We're going to take it and you're going to be you're going to be happy just a couple of weeks here. So they're looking to collect, I don't know, one percent over the course of nine days. Not an unreasonable sale, believe it or not. Not unreasonable at all. Let's get out to our final name before we unleash Stone Cold Uncle Mike upon us all here. Let's go out. It's a name we, we've talked about recently. It's uh, Fubo TV. <laughs> I just like this one. Ticker symbol Fubo. F U B O. Trading right now seven and a half bucks. Nice day for them today. Up fourteen point eight percent. So a big pop for Fubo TV today. Not sure what's driving this one out there, but my goodness, why uh, this one on fire today? It's not just Twitter catching a bit out there today, listeners. Let's see on the year a little bit of a different story. Off about sixty five percent. So. Not quite as good. A year ago, it was trading 21 and a half bucks. It rallied all the way up to not quite June 8th, listen. It was June 25th when it hit $35.10. That was its high for the year. Hung out there for a while. It got back into the, and hung out in the 30s pretty much until November. Then it started giving up the ghost pretty much to where we find it right now. And it was $6.55 just on Friday. So pretty much this thing has popped a buck just pretty much over the last few sessions out here so yeah a good little pop here but still pretty much not that far removed from its 52 week low of six dollars and one cent that it hit just a few sessions ago out there so actually yeah, it was march 14th when it dipped to that low but it's kind of been hanging out in the low six dollar range pretty much ever since until this past couple of sessions catching a nice little updraft here in fubo tv and let's see if our eye of sauron if those folks are buying this updraft it seems like they are or at the very least, they're looking to get themselves some juice. Someone coming in and looks like looks like they're blasting away on 10,000 of the seven puts in May for 87 cents. That's a, that's a fairly rich $7 put. That is, if you're wondering, a 110 volatility. Let's see this. They were 80, surprisingly tight, 86 and 90. So looks like Fubo's putting up some paper out there today. Let's see. What is the... What is the ADV in Fubo? Oh, it's thirty-two. It's forty thousand. Actually, I take it back. So that's that's a decent amount of paper here for Fubo TV out here. We're seeing a Palooza all over the place today, but the action is very much focused on this ten thousand lot. That is the biggest trade of the day. It looks like a total now of seventeen thousand of these puts have gone up. So someone liking themselves these seven puts in May. The stock was pretty much right here, seven fifty-eight. So it looks like I'm guessing these things are probably still trading around this level. So. A lot of juice to be found here on these May 7 puts. Again, the stock was 6 bucks not too long ago, so these things could easily be back to that level. But intriguing stuff. Mr. Meatball, what are your thoughts here on a pretty sizable line in the sand here and a pretty juicy one as well on the Fubo TV May 7 puts, sir? Yeah, so right now they're saying earnings might be around the 10th. Uh, huge size on this strike, 17000 on the day. Uh, they're trading ninety ninety four 94 vol going up. Uh, so... This is one of those kind of meme feel type of names. Remember, this was into the 50s back back a year ago and has just had a slow death um, and, and is now kind of that sub seven level getting a pop. Uh, you know, that's really nice yield if you want to own Fubo for, you know, six dollars and 20 cents. That's really nice yield if it can stay above seven bucks. So I, I get I totally get the trade. Uh, I get why they do it. If, if you're interested in this one, uh, you know, the, that trade makes a ton of sense to me. Uh oh, I think we're smelling a big money flower here. We shall see. Perhaps, dare I say it, a Gamdar trade. We shall mm -hmm. see as we keep on rolling <laughs> right on into the strategy block. 
It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the Strategy Block. All right, listeners, welcome to the Strategy Block. When you think of someone who personifies the stone cold image, you know, the bear drinking, fingers flying, stunners flying, just all sorts of just hardcore BA action. That is the stone cold persona. You think of none other than Uncle Mike Tusa from St. Charles Wealth Manager. You might have to start calling him Stone Cold Uncle Mike. Mr. Stone Cold Uncle Mike, what you got for us here on this first block of strategy for April, sir? Well, uh, with that introduction, that's quite a bit to live up to, but I will do my best. So what I want to talk about today is a married put. Why you would use it, when you would use it, advantages and disadvantages of it. First off, I've said this before on the show many times, but I'd like to say it again. There is no such thing in option trading as more or less risk. And what I mean by that is obviously there's more risk on a 100 lot than there is on a 10 lot. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is that when you use options, you're not getting rid of risk or you're not enhancing risk. You're simply shifting risk. There's a big difference. And so what I want to go through today is a married put. What that means is if you own a stock, you're buying a put option that is married to the same stock or index or whatever way you want to look at it. And by doing that, you're shifting your risk. Now, does that mean you're getting rid of your risk? No, you are not. So first off, why would you do it? Well, you are looking at the risk of owning the stock itself. And you're perhaps not comfortable with the downside risk that exists in the stock. Whether you're uncomfortable from the current price, uh, you're uncomfortable 10% below because if it drops that much, it's really going to go down, you think, uh, or whatever way you want to look at it. So you feel uncomfortable with holding the stock outright. So what you can do is you can buy a put option. What a put does is it gives you the right but not the obligation to sell a stock at the strike price any time between the time you buy it and the time with which the put expires. So when you're doing that, you're getting rid of the downside risk of the stock. Now, yes, I did just say getting rid of the downside of the stock to the premium with which you paid for that put option. So let's say that you feel that the premium on that put option is inexpensive. You believe the volatility is low on that put option because of the fact that you can get it for dirt cheap. Well, if that's the case, then it might be something to con- or something you may want to consider is buying that put option because if that put option is that cheap, then the cost of shifting the risk from the stock downside to the premium with which you pay for that put, whether it's one month, two months, nine months, or four years, it's a good deal for you. And that's what buying a married put is all about. It's about shifting risk from the downside of the stock to the premium with which you pay for the married put. Now, there's a lot of various ways with which you can do this. You can even buy a put spread if you want to shift it for just a certain portion of the downside risk of the stock. Uh, You can buy them near term, long term, whatever the case may be. Typically, what I like to look for when... Uh, how I would select buying a married put or when I would look to do it is I like to look at the fact that is the value of this put option at what I deem as a low enough level to justify doing that shift. Now, uh, today or possibly tomorrow, just depending on when I can get it out, I will have a YouTube video up for just this exact strategy. Uh, Check out St. Charles Wealth Management on YouTube to learn more about this. All right, and stay tuned for Around the Block to learn more about what's coming up around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block, where we tell you what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this week until we gather here together on Thursday. Really quickly, let's pay off some of our recent questions of the week. Like I said at the top of the show, we asked you guys last week, a flash poll during Volviews, you guys going to trade the new SVIX and UVIX product. And it was a pretty contentious right up until the last minute. Ended up going out, yes, ever so slightly, 53.3%. No, 46.7%. So 
pretty hot issue on that. I think we'll probably come back to that one and maybe see once we have a little bit more trading activity under our belt, maybe revisit that one. We also asked you guys last week our actual question of the week, not just a flash poll, was this recent VXX drama has focused the spotlight back on Vol product meltdowns. So we ask you guys, which Vol product implosion or failure or just overall drama has had the greatest impact on the overall volatility market? Give you four choices. The 2018 great SVXY neutering, the death of XIV also in 2018, the TVIX disaster of 2012, or the ongoing drama with VXX and XIV kind of ran away with this one. It closed out at 69% for XIV, followed by about 17% for the VXX, the current VXX drama, which is interesting. Maybe a little bit of recency bias there. A number three, the TVIX disaster, 10%, only about 3%. For SVXY, which gets us to our question of the week this week, like I mentioned at the top of the show here, again, XIV went away in 2018. A lot of people thought they couldn't or perhaps shouldn't ever come back. We did see SVIX relaunch last week. It claims to have solved the problems of XIV. I suppose we shall all see how there. A lot of people still wonder whether these things should even exist. So we put it to you this week. Our question of the week: Should inverse volatility products exist? Two very straightforward answers. Yes, they serve a purpose. Or no, they are too dangerous. And uh, it's like we got some hardcores in our audience. This went live right before showtime, so it's still very early voting. So far, we're at 100% for yes, they serve a purpose. (laughs) So interesting. I think once some some of the industry folks who follow us out there, once they see this and start weighing in, I got a feeling maybe the, the mood will shift a little bit out there. But either way, so far, folks liking themselves some s vix so mr meatball have you had a chance to play along with any s vix any updated thoughts on that b what are your thoughts on our poll are you surprised that our audience so far going all in on the return of vol or should say inverse vol products and then c what are you keeping an eye on until we gather here together on thursday sir yeah you, know, you know what's funny mark is i uh went to a party for a surprise party for my wife's best friend on Friday night. And I was sitting down talking to someone. They're like, oh, you're an option guy. I'm like, yeah. They started asking me about XIV. And I met one of the people that got out of XIV the day of before it completely imploded. He was like, yeah, when it get when it got to 80 bucks, I finally sold. I go, this is a random person at a party? Oh, you just, yeah, just really? a random person at a party. I was like, I'm so impressed by you. And he was like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you sold before the thing completely imploded. He's like, well, yeah, I mean, it was losing a lot of money. I was like, yeah, but everybody else just got eaten alive and you sold. I was like, good for you, buddy. Uh, so kind of an interesting story. Uh, SVX is seeing a lot of volume, SVIX. Uh, UVIX seeing more, still not super robust, but, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're showing consistently three, 400,000 shares a day. We are seeing some option volume in UVIX, SVIX, not as much yet. Um, I think that'll change as these things uh, come more to the forefront. But uh, right now, these products, they look pretty good. I got to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by the liquidity in them, certainly in the stock. Uh, and the options liquidity has not been terrible. There you go. Listen, you should have a subsequent poll too. Have you guys traded them yet? So uh, we asked you last week, will you trade them? Maybe a good question now is, have you traded them? Sounds like some people are getting in there. Have you gotten in there? Hit us up. Let us know. Mr. Uncle Mike, same question for you. Are you surprised at all that people so far are 100% on board with the return of these inverse vol products? And then B, what are you keeping an eye on till our next show on Thursday, sir? Well, I'm not surprised that people like them because from my understanding of it, the I guess just to me, it's like the two times and three times an inverse stock ETFs. I, it's a great solution from where there is no problem. And that uh, if I want to leverage myself on the S&P or go inverse on the S&P, there's calls, puts, and futures for that already. And so why do we need these products for the VIX? Well, I'll tell you why we need them is for smart people like Sebastian and our audience to um, make money off of them because they'll become predictably crappy or predictably something. And then that's typically where they will make money on them. So um Whatever way you want to look at it. So I guess I couldn't say I'm surprised that everybody wants them because uh, that's the purpose with which, from my standpoint, they seem to serve. Uh, in terms of what I'm keeping an eye on, I uh, want to see if we can break the 4,600 mark in the S&P. Uh, we are still negative on the year. So for that reason, I'm just in some very boring, out-of-the-money put spreads for my 
uh, S and P strategies. And that's kind of where I'm at with everything right now and watching to see if perhaps we can make a move. Unfortunately, listeners, that music means we have to move on out of here. Before we go, of course, we want to remind you, we've got for all you secret club kids live. We have the crypto rundown coming up in about exactly an hour. You after the fact on demand people. Don't worry. I haven't forgotten about you. You got it waiting for you on your device of choice, wherever you're listening to this on. Just hit next. It should be waiting there. Of course, this is a good week. If you're not in the secret club, you probably want to join us this week. We're giving you all sorts of abundance of goodness, including a double pro Q&A tomorrow with none other than the Viceroy himself returning for the first time in the year of 2022. He's always a fun one. He's always always down to answer a question or two, as well as Mr. Greg Magadini. He'll be doing a twofer as well. He's joining me in about an hour on the Crypto Rundown to talk a lot about crypto ball and skewing all that goodness. He'll be answering your crypto questions in detail tomorrow. If that's not enough twofer for you, we've got a double dose of boot camp coming for you live in the Secret Club on Education Wednesday. And of course, for everyone else on demand, you'll have to wait a week to get the second dose, as well as oddities on Friday. So a good week to visit theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club. See what the heck's going on over there. Let's go around the horn. Mr. Meatball, what the heck's going on in the land of the pit, sir? Yeah, well, just uh, make sure you're reading our blog all the time. We're writing on the VIX. We're writing on, you know, these new products. We kind of broke them down a little bit, and we have been uh, all over kind of big money flow. So, yeah, if you want really good free written content, uh, that is going to help you become a better trader. Go to optionpit.com and uh, read that Dix Edge blog and the Pit Report. And then maybe you too can encounter that infamous gentleman who was the lone guy to get out of XIV when the getting was good. <laughs> Hats off to that guy. Well done. I know. I Indeed. was really impressed. That's like the inverse cabbie indicator. You usually talk to somebody at a party, they tell you some nonsensical story, and you have to just dismiss it. But that sounds like that guy was pretty savvy. So well done to him out there you know who else is pretty pretty savvy he's the uncle list of mike's aka stone cold uncle mike stone cold uncle mike if folks want to check out all your stone coldness in all its glory where should they go what should they do feel free to follow me on twitter at mike tusaw t-o-s-a-w check out my youtube channel type in st charles wealth management uh, and you can also check out my website st charles wealth.com if you're looking for a financial advisor who promises not to give you a stunner no stunner. This is what they're paying for. The folks want a stunner. They want a stone cold Uncle Mike stunner. Hit him up for yourselves. Let's see if he can rethink that policy. StCharlesWealth.com is the place to go. We got to get on out of here. We'll be back in 58 minutes live now for all you cool secret club kids on the crypto rundown. On demand after the fact on your device of choice. Tomorrow, double dose of pro Q&A. Man, they're working me over here this week. Wednesday, double dose of education Wednesday. Actually, I neglected to mention earlier, double dose of live options boot camp back to back and then after that yes you're getting a rear live huddle with mr overby there after that as well you guys are getting so much content this week it's almost embarrassing so check it out theoptionsider.com slash pro is the place to go if you want to get all that live and in your ear holes we'll be back again a little bit for crypto rundown then back again on thursday for episode two of the option block stay safe out there everybody You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.